Dear guests, good evening everybody. Welcome to CU Business School. And thank you for finding time this Wednesday late afternoon or early evening and coming joining us for our MBA open house. We welcome you and we hope that you find the event interesting and also you will gain the useful information. Uh, all of you received the folders, you can find the detailed agenda of the event and uh, hopefully we will follow the agenda minute by minute so it means that by 8 o'clock we should move upstairs on our nice terrace. The weather is lovely outside so we can have some networking sessions, some drinks and food and you can see people, our staff, faculty, current students and alumni, please feel free to ask questions and uh, gain as much as possible information about the program. We are here for that to help you with that. So, now, if we don't have any questions, let's move to the event itself. Let me give the floor to our Dean and Professor Mel Horvich. And uh, a few words before Mel starts, let me introduce him. Uh, Professor Horvich, before joining CU Business School, uh, worked and he taught at technology management at Polytechnic Institute of New York University. He also served there as the faculty director of the Clean Tech Execs Executive Program of the New York Poly. Uh, besides that, he's a distinguished expert on entrepreneurship and innovation management. He's an author of a number of publications in the field. He's been a visiting professor at London Business School, University of Paris Dauphin, Oxford University, Sloan School, MIT, and Harvard Business School. He is a graduate of Princeton University and holds MBA and doctorate from Harvard Business School. And last but not least, uh, he's been a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand. If I missed anything, please. No, I, I forgot it all. <laughs> thank you. Please, floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, David. And I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, I see some faces I know and a few faces who I hope to know uh, during the next academic year. And uh, what I'd like to do is. Um, Is, is, is kind of identify with you. Um, I haven't been here, I'm, and now I'm talking to the uh, potential candidates here at the school. I want to identify with you. I haven't been here very long. I'm a new dean. I can't really even tell you much about the program. There are other people here who are, are much better and better informed than I am. But I just want to say that you and I, I have a choice that you have now. Why would I want to come to see you business school? What is it about this institution that would make me live, leave uh, a nice place, a nice place in New York City, maybe some of you have heard of New York City, uh, a job that was really a great job, and uh, like you, I had lots of choices. I had uh, all kinds of programs that we mentioned we were doing a terrific and exciting clean tech program in New York and sustainability, something I'd like to bring here, by the way, next year, and I could have stayed in New York and would have been very comfortable with my kids in New York and so on, but I decided uh, to come to see you business school. And I just want to tell you why I did it and why I think it's something that you should consider stronger. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about the present, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the future. Uh, the present YCEU Business School is a great place now. It's unique, it's a jewel, it's located in a terrific, in a terrific city, Budapest, it's kind of a crossroads. It represents something that I think is almost unparalleled in management and education. Uh, the faculty is outstanding. And I thought it was outstanding even before I made the choice to come here and getting to know my colleagues over the past four months, getting to know them very well. Actually, uh, they are unique. Uh, they're terrific to work with. They're completely accessible uh, for, for, for the students. Uh, they're dedicated to their profession, and they go the last mile in doing it. I mean, we have an example. You'll, you'll see Mache later, uh, a distinguished faculty member of ours, uh, he even decided to do original curriculum development to bug the dean to get resources to do a movie, uh, and the dean finally gave in. And uh, you know, I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, Zoltan is here, and Zoltan is outstanding in creating a classroom experience and creating innovative processes so everybody learns. 
it goes the last mile. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I just do, I never told all the time this. To make sure that every student is important, feels important, and structures uh, the learning experience around each and every student. And that sort of signifies something about this, about this institution. The curriculum is modern, it's pace setting, it has an underlying theme of leadership and transnationalism, and it's something that we're going to improve on in the future. Uh, and there's a whole ecosystem here of alumni, faculty, students, the larger university, CBU, where everyone is close and works together. There are no boundaries here. And uh, that's unique in any kind of business school I've been at. I've been at a lot of them, and usually the boundaries are very strong. As I said, at Harvard, the river is very wide between the school and the rest. Uh, so this organization is committed and we have many, many staff people here who stay late, work on weekends. If there's any kind of issue with a student, if a student's ill, they make sure that that student gets the best attention. And they'll even call the dean in the middle of the night on a Sunday to make that happen. <laughs> uh, we are not satisfied. We are continually trying to improve our curriculum. We do it both incrementally, incrementally and we're actually an example of this is the entrepreneurship concentration that we now offer. It's in our uh, MBA curriculum, and uh, it's, it's one of the things that we're going to anchor uh, the whole business school experience on in the future. And I'll come to that in a second. So we also now have a, a new learning experience, a global city experience in New York City uh, that will be open to our MBA MBA students, and that will take place in the spring, and we'll spend about nine days in New York City gaining that experience since we do give an American MBA. So there's also, I just want to kind of touch on the past for one second. There's a unique heritage at CU Business School. It's unique at the university, it's unique at the business school. It has to do with the open society, it has to do with uh, George Soros, who contributed uh, the money to make the whole university and the business school click and work. We're the largest endowed. We have the most endowment of any institution of higher education in the economy of Europe. Actually, within Europe, I think only Oxford and Cambridge, you may have heard of them, have a larger endowment in Europe. So, and not only do we have a large endowment, because as you know, sometimes money is dangerous, but we try to use it well. We try to use it to improve what we're doing, uh, to go the next mile, um, and do it, and uh, and that's very, very important. I want to mention something else. This institution and the university was founded on a special idea called the Open Society, where we try to bring not just best practices, but uh, democracy, human rights, uh, and we want to bring that to the world. We want to be good corporate citizens, good institutional citizens. And that is very important. One thing that had, was missing from the Open Society when it started was what is the role of entrepreneurship? What's the role of bringing economic opportunity uh, to an economy? What's the role of bringing, uh, of bringing hope, economic hope? And one thing we do at CU Business School, we contribute to the notion of the Open Society by also adding the idea that you really can't have democracy, uh, human rights, unless you give people hope. So they can not just put food, uh, have bread on the table, but also there's hope for a better future. And we try to do that at CU Business School for the rest of the university. So there's, I just want to say a couple more words about the future. In the future that you will be in, and you are the future. You are the future. And uh, I can tell you right now that the future, in some ways, I hope, is even going to be more exciting than the past or the present. The future, you are entering an institution that is on the move. It, it's in sync with the 21st century, maybe in a way it had not been up to now. We have all kinds of plans to take what we have as a great education experience already and a great organization already and a great learning culture already and we are going to make it even better we're going to we're going to we're going to introduce 
entrepreneurship, and innovation management. The creation of new things under the sun. We are going to introduce new ways to utilize technology, not from the point of view of an engineer or a computer scientist, but from a managerial point of view, into our learning and into how you make strategic decisions about, about a company. We are going to, we already have a very, very fine special course given by Professor Bodo called Action Learning. We're going to build on that unique course, which most schools don't have, most of the schools in the world don't have, and we're going to introduce, we're now planning to introduce an incubator that where new startups can, uh, can work together, can be in the same place where students will have the opportunity to work with startups in order to see what it means to bring a new enterprise into fruition and to scale up, not just start, but to ramp up, which as many of you know is a key problem in innovation and entrepreneurship. So there are new vistas. Uh, I hope, and this is a, sort of a pet area of mine, that we will be strong, stronger in sustainability and clean tech, which is another key industry and area of opportunity. It's not just something that's good. It's an area of opportunity uh, in the 21st century. I believe that we're at a clean tech and sustainability now is like the internet was in the mid-90s. It's about to take off where there are all kinds of ways that uh, smart professionals, smart professionals can, can have a terrific career and make money if they want. So we're kind of a portal into a very, very cosmopolitan world. And I think we're the real, only real portal in this region that really can introduce best practices and then gain traction here and elsewhere in the world, particularly in emerging economies, but not only that. Uh, that's the kind of we, we not only not only do we have great teaching, but we do research. Not only do we have great teaching, but we have permanent faculty. We just don't bring in adjuncts. We have a terrific cadre of permanent faculty. And then we complement them with outstanding adjuncts, professionals, people who are really out there doing things who we vetted and we think our students uh, can really learn from and develop great courses. So there's a sort of a balance between theory and practice, between research and practitioners, and we try to put this together in a very modern way. So we represent a kind of new style business school designed for an ecosystem in the 21st century. And that is including some areas that we're going to emphasize even more in the future. Leadership, not just leadership, but also creative leadership to do new things. And this is an area that's just ripe for learning and, and I think to be an MBA and get this kind of uh, interaction and exposure will give them an advantage in their career. As I said, entrepreneurship and innovation management is going to be even more important than it's been, and that's new. And we're going to kind of have an ecosystem approach. We're going to leverage the whole environment. We're going to work with our partners, our outside partners. We have all kinds of exchange programs. Uh, Professor Mayer is in charge of the exchange programs, other universities and we're going to learn from our partners and we're going to interact with them. We also have very, very close relationships with other departments at the university. Environmental studies, law, public policy, economics, and we're going to have more courses and more interactions so that those of you who are interested in really seeing the state of the art in kind of very sophisticated areas of financial economics, for example, can work with, can work with Professor Peter Condor in the economics department who wins awards being a leader in the kind of financial engineering and uh, financial services. So we have these new models. We're developing a new IT infrastructure. And Professor Ross is here uh, using Moodle, in which is used now all over the world. And so we're having a much more robust IT learning infrastructure. And of course, we're bringing the highest standards of professionalism. Not just how to be a professional, but also in terms of ethics and integrity and corporate social responsibility. We just won an award, uh, uh, a $3 million grant from Siemens uh, to launch a whole project on the on integrity, on to bring integrity to the world. Uh, Professor Peter Hardy is in charge of that. So I mean this is a this is a school that I mean, that's a, it's a great place 
Now we have this new style. Uh, we're working with people all over the world. We have a terrific network of people everywhere. Uh, we're completely international. There's no place I've seen on earth that has as many people from different backgrounds as we do. We are, we are not simply a Hungarian school. We're certainly not an American school. But we're sort of balanced throughout the world, advanced and emerging, north and south, east and west. And we all sort of come together in this crossroads city where it's a, a great place to live. So I think that, you know, your, your timing is impeccable to consider this place. And I'm just uh, excited to be here. And I'll learn with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel. I think all of us are very optimistic after speech of our dean and getting ready for our exciting faculty, Professor Maciej Kisilowski. I think for me personally, and I think most of our colleagues would agree, Maciej is a clear example of unlimited accomplishments, both in academic and professional field. And looking at his relatively young age, he has even a long more way to go. So, Professor Maciej Kisilowski <laughs> receives his master law degree from Yale Law School, Master in Public Administration in Economics and Public Policy from Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, and he holds MBA with distinction from INSEAD. He also holds PhD in Law and uh, MA with distinction from Warsaw University, and is currently completing another doctorate in Legal Science at Yale University School of Law. Uh, besides his research interest, which includes theory of regulation and public management, he also has consulted many well-known public and not-for-profit organizations, including the Secretary General of the European Commission, Committee for Economic Development, Washington DC, and the offices of the President and Prime Minister of Poland. And as a teacher, I can, I, I can witness it myself, it's really beloved by the students, and now, now you will have a chance to experience it yourself. Maciej, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So, why do you need a lawyer in a business school? Yes, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, people who are, let me open it, oh, okay. So, uh, you know, people, uh, as you've seen, I am sort of a perpetual, I, I was sort of a perpetual student, uh, and people ask me two questions. First of all, why on earth I would uh, end up in a business school, in Budapest in particular, and second, you know, what kind of experiences from my past, uh, you know, graduate background I focus on most importantly and try to uh, sort of replicate in class. So, starting from the second question, I want to say that actually what uh, my sort of broad multidisciplinary education gave me mostly is examples of how not to approach business government interaction. So what I do in class is in a sense, uh, you know, it's a course that I would love to have had myself in, you know, any of the places I attended, but unfortunately didn't have. And the, the reason why I did not have it in any of the major uh, educational institutions that I, that I attended is that, you know, those sort of well-established well-known, reputable institutions have this uh, sort of idea of creating programs and focusing on research of the world as it should be, as opposed to the world as it is. And I think what's great about this place is, is that it's immersed in a context, social, political, economic, when you simply cannot escape the reality is that the world that, uh, that we have around us, the world that we will face as, as entrepreneurs, especially at the intersection of private sector and the political, uh, you know, broadly conceived public regulatory sector, is actually very far from what we would like it to be. And the sooner we, we acknowledge that we are living in this highly imperfect world, the better and the more fun and intellectual benefit we can get from our research and from our teaching. Um, so that's, that's why I ended up here. I'm sort of a case study of what Mel was telling you about, you know, this place, you know, being totally independent of any government, 
of any public money funded by you know an amazing uh, you know philanthropist uh, who like build the foundation of this place for endowment but you know also gathering people who like me want to uh, you know take the toolkit that we gain in you know good places where, where, where we got our you know doctoral and research education and try to apply it to something that's real yes I mean to, to some uh, to, to, a, to a place where the action is and you know anybody who walks here who lives here uh, in this part of the world knows that there is a lot of action at the uh, you know borderline between entrepreneurship private sector businesses and government and you know, usually the word that describes these interactions, this borderline, this fence, is probably hell. Yes, uh, let's try to uh, to deal with it. And you know, it's interesting because even like reputable mainstream sources like McKinsey, you know, belatedly start to recognize this. Yes, I mean, this is the this is like. In three weeks old, the new uh, executive uh, survey of McKinsey that essentially concludes, based on the interviews with top executives around the world, that governments and regulators are second only to customers in terms of their strategic importance for companies. So, you know, so uh, it is, uh, you know, it is nice that those people are saying those things. But, you know, I would like to say, well, I've been, you know, telling this in my classroom for the last three years, yes? So it's not news for my students. Um, but it's good that, that it's being recognized. So, you know, if we want to look at business-government interaction, if, you, if we want to look at government as potential, you know, as part of the and broader environment of business that impacts its competitive advantage, should, shall we, you know, use the concept of thinking about ideas such as public service, or civil virtue, or maybe common good? That's what you would hear in most of the institutions. Yes, you would, if, uh, you know, if, at, at my uh, uh, business and, po and public policy course in, in the business school I graduated from, the idea was, you know, to describe what would be the ideal regulatory framework. What is it that we should expect the government, uh, you know, to deliver? And that's a, that's a noble goal, yes? I mean, it's, it's, it's great to create those expectations among young people, future managers, um, that we will demand better from our government. Unfortunately, as many of you know very well, uh, you know, it will take a very, very long time uh, to see the world in which those words will describe the interactions between business and governments. I actually would say that the better words are probably bribes, are probably abuse of power. Think about retroactive taxation of bonuses in this very country. Incompetence, ever, you know, interacted with administrative officials to, you know, renew your driving license. Well, I, I, I guess you will uh, see more of the incompetence than, than, than public service or civic virtue in uh, these interactions, unfortunately. Yes, and unfortunately a lot of connections, yes? I mean, people the, who are the insiders as opposed to, you know, the rest. Um, so, you know, welcome to the business school <laughs> for the highly imperfect world. Yes, this is not a school that will, you know, try to uh, picture this world of private jets and executive suites um, and, you know, high-level meetings with, uh, you know, the President of the United States. It is the school that will essentially try to prepare you for the wild west you are going to encounter the day you are graduating. Because this is going to be a wild west. And there are essentially two approaches to business education. One is to create a fiction that, you know, you will all 
and uh, you, you know, leave, you will leave the graduation party in a big limo and then board your private jet. And the other approach that we prefer is to teach you about how to survive in the world as it is. So, for the re remainder of this, of this, of this talk, I, I want to give you a few examples, both in terms of my research of this highly imperfect world of business government interaction and how it impacts the teaching that I, that I deliver in the MBA program. So in, in terms of research, we actually set up a research center here that, you know, unlike many other centers on business and policy, tries to really focus on how to innovate in this highly flawed world of emerging, developing, transitional economies, which are very dynamic and interesting, but the public sector is sort of not catching up. So, you know, a few things about the, about the research center. Well, the first thing is that, you know, it's not like a bunch of people who, you know, sit and uh, theorize about, uh, you know, some sort of abstract stuff. It is essentially a network of academics and practitioners. It is very important for us. Okay, Mel mentioned an important thing that we have a full-time research faculty here, but it does not mean that we create sort of a little ivory tower when we read, you know, abstract academic papers and don't care about how it works in practice. Actually, the, the way my research center works is that it seeks the interaction and, you know, at the very early stage, challenging the ideas that we generate with actual practitioners. Yes, uh, private and public. We want to hear from the beast. Yes, we want to hear from the government. Uh, we know that they are, you know, corrupt, incompetent. But it's still better to talk with them. Yes, you better know your enemy very well. Uh, it's very multidisciplinary. We don't care about, you know, I am political science. I am lawyer. I am this or that. You know what? That is all complete waste of time. We should focus on problems and then choose the right tools to solve them instead of, you know, focusing on our, you know, favorite discipline and then look for facts that will confirm our own theories. So, yes, I mean, what I mentioned before, that this, this, this match between, like, the ambition to be a, you know, a world-level uh, research institution, but also locally relevant, uh, Yes, the other thing that Mel already mentioned, which is, which is great that he emphasized it, is that we are the school of innovation. We don't want to, you know, create another London Business School or another INSEAD here. We, we are creating something new. Uh, and yes, we are not uh, worried about offending people. I mean, we are especially not worried about offending corrupt government. Uh, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> frankly, the reason why we are not worried about it is because of the amazing philanthropic contribution of George Soros, who essentially created this institution as a completely independent, you know, island of thought, of progressive thought. Um, <coughs> so you uh, may mentioned the movie that, that was that premiered, uh, you know, an hour ago. It was a lot of fun. It, uh, it is a story of a, a huge corruption scandal with actual names of actual politicians uh, in it. Uh, we have a lot of international research projects, and yes, this is all relevant for classroom use. So how is it relevant? Let me give you a very quick example. So if we are talking about the practical, the day you graduate, yes, you may want to join a startup, you may want to establish your business. Well, there is you. There is you who is like full of ideas, full of potential. Uh, there are opportunities, there are, there are, you met people who have similarly interesting ideas. You want to start something new, and we want you to start something new, but unfortunately, before you can even start something new, there is a massive bureaucratic wall in front of you, 
Yes, the tax agency, the occupational safety agency, maybe, you know, you, are, you work in a regulated industry, so you will have financial regulator or this regulator. At the end of the day, even the fireman in the big helmet will come and say that your building is not, you know, uh, does not adhere to proper standards, yes? So, in essence, there is a wall that separates you from your business objectives, whatever it is. And, you know, what we believe is that part of destroying this wall, or, you know, making it a little, a little, little shorter, is to give you knowledge, to give you tools to understand what's behind the wall. And actually, you know, to give you an example of what we, we would be doing in class, what is behind the wall is usually some sort of administrative agency. It is like some sort of bureaucratic organization. And you know what? It's even more concrete. Because actually within this organization, there is some person. There will be a face that actually will be dealing with your case. Yes? So instead of a wall, now you have a concrete person. Yes? I mean, you know, you can imagine this. I mean, it maybe not, uh, will not look like this. Maybe will like, you know, wear like an old sweater or, you know, and jeans and there will be, you know, you will visit uh, them in their office and there will be these little paprika strips on the, you know, little plate so that they can, you know, make their work a little more exciting. I mean, you can see the picture, yes, of, the, of a bureaucrat who will decide your case. Well, actually not quite. He will not decide your case. He will usually prepare your file for somebody else to decide. He is the face of the government. You will need to deal with him or her, but somebody else will be actually making the final determination. So now, anybody can tell me, do you think it's a good idea if, let's create a hypo. Let's imagine that I come to you and say, listen, this guy, the decision maker, is actually my good buddy. So, my suggestion is you actually don't even approach this guy, the, no, the usual official face of this agency at the lower level, you go to, straight to this guy. Anybody has a comment on this approach? Skipping this guy and going straight to the decision maker. What do you think? Good or bad idea? Why do you think it's a good idea? You get the faster response. Okay. Okay. Any other uh, uh, suggestions or views? Where in the world would you do that? So, I mean, it might be easier in Brazil than in the United States. And uh, say, I, I, think, I think we should go about the rules. We should follow the rules. Because if we don't follow the rules, obviously. Go ahead. <laughs> And if, if, if it's that complicated, many people try to cut. Yeah. But uh, in an idle, you were talking about an idle world, uh, I would follow the rules. So, so we have two uh, very different views, how untypical of this place. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, there is one idea, of course, go for the decision maker. Forget the, you know, guy with paprika strips. Uh, and the other uh, um, approach is, no, actually, you should, do, uh, you should follow the rules. What about another strategy? You know, even if you contact this guy, it's still this guy who will actually deal with your file. Agreed, yes? Because the, the busy decision maker just signs the paper. So, you know, totally ignoring this guy and going straight to this guy creates an enemy. Yes? And it creates a, really a needless uh, enemy because you know what? There is a very, very easy way to have it both ways, which is you use your contact with the top decision maker, but you acknowledge, you, you show the respect to the desk level administrator so that they feel actually, they even feel better because they know, you know, they know you have the connection. Everybody knows, yes? If you have it, if you use it, everybody in the agency knows you have it. 
So, you know, so they know you have a connection and they are used to the fact that everybody who has connection just treats them as junk, yes? They just go straight to the decision maker. You will be the one person who will visit them and, you know, wish them happy birthday. Even though you perhaps not, don't need it. But now you have two friends in the agency, yes? And it took half an hour of a visit to the paprika guy, yes? So, so, that, so you know, so, so this, this would be the best case scenario, of course. It assumes that you, that you know the decision maker, but even if you do, you know, is it really that difficult to show this guy a little respect so that you don't have an enemy? Now, if you don't know the decision maker, well, there are still things that you can do to approach them, yes? Well, yes, so uh, that, that is the... That is the typical organizational thing, yes? This guy will always have some sort of independence. That's why I said it's not the best idea to actually make an enemy out of him. But let's get to those things that can influence those guys, yes? So, surprisingly enough for me, I would actually claim that sometimes law does influence decisions, yes? Most often, probably, it's not that relevant, but actually, from time to time, Bureaucrats make decisions according to the law. And I think uh, that's why it is sometimes useful to use legal constraints, uh, especially when the issue is clear cut and that, uh, then acting against the law will impose a cost on a bureaucrat. Organizational culture, this is uh, not really my field, this is Zoltan's field, but you know, but you can use that's why my course is after his course, because then you can use the tools that he will tell, uh, teach you about the organizational behavior to try to actually influence those guys here. Social network. You know, I asked in one of my classes, you know, how would you socialize with these guys? And it was an executive uh, education class, so a lot of senior managers, and one guy raised his hand and said, you know what? That's really easy. You have all the money. <laughs> so, you know, so you throw a party, yes? I mean, it, you actually find somebody who actually sends the, the, their kids to the same school as this guy or this guy. Yes? I mean, if you start thinking about, you know, this uh, kind of approach, you realize that, you know, this crude way of dealing with the world, yes, the world that doesn't exist anymore, yes? You, because of the knowledge you have, you are able to eliminate the world. And guess what? You are not paying a bribe, which is, by the way, still a crime, as far as I, as far as I understand, even in Central Europe. Um, so, you know, in a sense, the conclusion would be bribery for me, apart from the ethical aspect, which is, uh, you know, a separate and though important consideration, bribery for me is, you know, sort of a sign of intellectual laziness. It's like lack of sophistication. Because there are so many ways you can interact with, the, with even with deeply flooded, corrupt, incompetent, abusive government without breaking the law. It's safer for you. It actually, you know, does not create uh, sort of an ethical tension with them within your organization. And you know what? I can tell you, it's bloody effective. <laughs> so, well, hopefully to be continued next year. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Marjorie. <clears throat> And now let me invite to the, give the floor to Michael Magnat, to our uh, alumnus. <clears throat> Michael has graduated in Indiana University and after that he did IMM program with our school. Being an American citizen, he uh, has spent the last 20 years in the region of Central and Eastern Europe, being consulting the big multinational companies on major investments in the field. He's been working for Deloitte and Aston Young. Currently he owns his own consulting business, he's the owner and managing director. 
And just as a matter of fact, it would be mostly interest for the most of the audience. He's currently advising the owners of Danubius and the Schlager Radio. As you know, this uh, well-known case, so maybe we can hear some more information about that. Thank you. Sorry, yes. <clears throat> well, uh, tough to follow the good professor here, um, particularly because my business uh, actually started about 10 years ago, specializes in investor state negotiations, usually when things go wrong. So this is a case where uh, a company has acquired something, done a concession, a uh, new government happens, uh, you may know the decision maker, government changes, and then you're really in big trouble. Before that, I was an investment banker doing privatization across the region, and I was very lucky to be here at a very dynamic time. So uh, I think the professor's course, frankly, would be interesting for me to take, uh, simply because a lot of what is in theory, uh, you end up having to put into practice. Now, as an entrepreneur, I have to say the Dean's speech about taking your concepts from class and turning it into your own business hit, hit home, because that's exactly why I took an MBA at CEU. As opposed to going and trying to get a flashy name on a diploma, uh, hopefully get some intellectual stimulation along the way, the nice thing about CEU is that the people are accessible. It's nice to see some professors that I've had, actually, sitting in the course, and some former students where I was an adjunct uh, and I am an adjunct, actually, at the Transnational Negotiation course. So when the dean was speaking about taking uh, professors strong in theory, matching them up with adjuncts who have a lot of business experience, uh, hopefully I will satisfy the dean's standard in that regard. Um, one thing related to you as a student is uh, I would say that you are the onion. And in this case, I was the onion. And the common expression is you need to peel the onion. Well, when you peel an onion to understand a problem and you try to understand yourself, you're going to cry sometimes, but at the end of it, you might have a wonderfully fantastic, tasty dish or something that you never even intended. But I, I took this because I wanted to be able to enable myself. I wanted to be able to take from others because I had graduated 20 years ago and update and refresh my knowledge base, my terminology, and understand what the world is today. So in the classes that I had, you had a nice mix of, I think, 40 different countries, uh, terrible number of cross-cultural misunderstandings, uh, language issues. We all spoke language, but we all didn't speak the same language. Uh, and it was a wonderful, at the end of the, the, the course, we all spoke the same form of English. Uh, but at the beginning, we definitely didn't. Uh, you mix. You mix different people and, and you're going to get different results. And I think the most important thing that a potential student should understand is it's really all about you. Everybody here is supposed to help you. And if you don't try to understand, in my opinion, three basic things, which is commitment, sensitivity, and courage, if you follow those three things, I think you'll be a great student for yourself. What I mean by that is this program is what you put in, is what you'll get out. You don't know me very well, some of you do, but I, I like to joke around a fair bit. I like to push the envelope on, uh, on theory. Because I think theory in and of itself um, needs to be applied. So I really think that it's important that you commit to engage. Too many people uh, in too many cultures understand that you're supposed to sit in class and listen. And they'll wait for an hour and ask a question. So as far as this presentation goes, I would ask you to commit to engage. And you don't have to wait for me to move on to something. Please feel free to ask something along the way. One thing definitely that will happen is, although you probably already know everything and you know how to manage your time and you don't need anybody to teach you how to do any of that, the fact is you're going to have to. If you have an MBA student, you're going to have to prioritize. And what I mean by prioritize is uh, not put your studies first necessarily but put you first, and what that means is balance your time and sharpen your skills and sharpen your management skills with your other students and your other team members. Because if you don't have the courage to say your opinion or have the courage to, to care about what you're learning about, then frankly you're going to leave the program with nothing except a wonderful piece of paper and a few friendships. And hopefully that won't be the case. In addition, you need to embrace the diversification. Uh, as an American, uh, I'm often accused of, of being the one that comes in and knows everything. 
right? Americans have a particular cultural aspect and in different countries have that profile. Well, uh, I've been fortunate enough to live in Japan, uh, work in Asia, work in Central and Eastern Europe, and when I was 25, I knew everything. And when I was 26, I realized I didn't know anything. And it's taken me about 15 years, yes, I'm 41, and to realize that I'm still learning. And the great thing about it is, sometimes you'll find that you can have abrasions with people. You should embrace the abrasion. Learn from why you have that difference. And in your team, don't view that person as a stone in the road or something else. Learn from that person because, frankly, they're here because they also care. And they're not stupid either. Nobody's stupid you're going to go to school with. That's the whole point of admissions, right? And uh, hopefully uh, you can be sensitive to that. And in sensitivity, that's where you're going to, frankly, understand that when you graduate from a program like this, no matter what company you work for, if you're an entrepreneur trying to deal with administration, if you're an entrepreneur trying to figure out who to hire, if you're a multinational organization, uh, I worked for Deloitte & Touche and I worked for Ernst & Young, uh, I promise you I won't ever work for a big organization like that again because it was very hard for me to adapt to that corporate culture. And I didn't understand how to adapt. Now frankly I understand better how to adapt and I've got more clients from those big four companies because I've learned better how to appreciate their corporate culture and not view it as an impediment. So I think that as a student, you should try to find things that you like about the things you don't like. <laughs> and that sensitivity to others will help you grow. And, and frankly, what you learn should lead to change. Whatever you're learning, if you leave here and say, you know, fantastic, I, I knew that. You know, of course, well, I knew that. And I, well, that's good. I did that in my job. And that was great because I knew how to do that. <clears throat> well, then you're frankly not doing the course very well. You're, you're not supposed to know. And no matter what you do know, I promise you there's other things you don't know. And that's uh, from somebody who, who, on occasion, as an advisor, you're supposed to know everything. Right? You're not supposed to not know. But, uh, uh, and in my MBA program, I had to learn uh, to say I don't know. And that was a very hard thing for me to do at the beginning because of my work. But if you learn the spatial nature of your courses, and what I mean by spatial nature of your courses on the next slide, you will get knowledge, you will get awareness of your relevance, and you will get functionality. And then, uh, a little quote I like to say is, you will bring to light your own idea. You will learn who you are in a different way than when you enter the program. And your predispositions about your groundedness and your stability hopefully will slightly be changed. Can't list all the courses, so if there's any courses I didn't name up here, apologies, professors, no disrespect uh, intended. Uh, what I mean to say about the spatial nature is people tend to go into the program thinking, um, I'm an engineer, uh, or I'm, uh, I work a lot with law, so uh, I work with law. How do I use marketing to make me better? We make us the center of those bubbles. Shouldn't do that. You should understand you're just a bubble frankly, and you will learn at the end of the course how to move your bubble <laughs> through your organization. And sometimes you are much more relevant and you have to coordinate here on some issues like um, uh, product uh, liability, this is probably easy, and the cost to do that, and the insurance for directors and officers and whatnot, but frankly some things they'll move across. So you're going to realize in your function, every time you get a new job, by the way, I would suggest you do that, you figure out how relevant you are. This concentric circles showing your spatial relative importance is very important. Because everyone thinks I got promoted, but they don't understand the dynamic. So uh, that, that's one thing that I think you should learn, that you can learn in the MBA, is to uh, take your courses and apply them across. Because if you don't learn that they're not isolated courses and yourself, because frankly, your professors can't do that. Your professor's job is to teach you this. They, they've got a mission, they've got to do it, you've got to get an output, but you have to help build those bridges because they're bridges you're going to need. And you have to communicate that to your professors. Otherwise, they can't read your mind. And I promise you, uh, all the professors will be there. Uh, Maria was with me throughout the program and Tibor, if I believe he's still here. Uh, I, I was a pretty vocal guy in that process. And 
That's true. And, and the reason I mention this, this isn't about me, because I'm, I'm frankly nobody. I came from no money. I came from a, a family where I paid my own undergraduate in the States. I, I didn't come with a silver spoon in my mouth. Uh, I started my own company the first year out of school. It failed one year later. Uh, I started another company, and then and that failed. And then I realized I better go learn a few things and work for some multinationals. And then 10 years ago, I started my own company, uh, two of them in fact, and I'm very happy to say that I'm still in business through a very difficult economic time. But that doesn't mean that I was smart. It means I was lucky along the way and I could apply some things. And in the middle of all of that, something quite important I learned was uh, you have to have the courage to try. All that means is I tried. Another year, another few things will happen. And I can make another slide about all my failures along the way. And I would encourage you that when you are looking at how to apply yourself, remember, you got to be not only the onion, but you got to be the knife. And so as you go through the MBA, you learn who you are and apply your skills and figure out what makes you work. And at the end of it, you should become that knife. And you should go around and cut your own onions. On a personal experience, uh, uh, just for the Hungarians here, I work a lot on um, what are called investor state disputes. So for example, if the company is nationalized uh, or if uh, a concession is canceled, and in the case of the radio stations here, um, there was a tender which was lost and I represent uh, the two investors who were enemies for 12 years in the market, hate each other. So I convinced them both to hire me. They didn't know they were hiring me yet, right? First I had to network. And they both hired me and I convinced them to work together because if the two people who were um, disrespected, shall we say, unlawfully by the government, uh, work together, it's very difficult for the government to fight them because governments love to treat things unique, right? So in the case of Danubius and Schlager, there is an element of political corruption and trafficking influence, which is the undertone. And then there is the commercial aspect and there is the restructuring aspect. Lay off all the workers, what happens to the brand, what happens to the finance. So usually in business school we teach how to build something. Uh, I would caution you to learn how to deal with taking things apart. Also because sometimes uh, you need to break things down because if you simply cling to an idea too long, uh, you can lose. And in that respect, uh, I think that CEU truly, and I'm not saying that because I'm an alum, I don't have to say that, uh, I, I'm here because I'd like to communicate that to you, that it's not, it's not something that you should take for granted. A lot of schools don't have the ability to put you with students from different lands in a different context and frankly care about you because they, they might care about other things. And I can only say that CEU sincerely cares about not only its own brand name, but it cares about the people who will leave the program because they become the ambassadors for the program. And I hope that, frankly, I'm a good ambassador, and I can see other alum here that obviously are represented that they are also good ambassadors, so thank you also for coming to help. And I would ask if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer question if that's all right. Otherwise, we'll continue with the program and get upstairs and you can ask me there. We good? Excellent. Thank you. Enjoy the very exciting presentations. Now comes the boring part. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hope you can stay with us. Um, David and I are going to introduce you some basic backgrounds of the program and like our curriculum and the admission requirements. So we have three MBA levels programs. One is a full-time MBA program. One is, one is the executive MBA. It's running part-time. And the other is a multinational, the IMM program. We also have company, ta company tailored uh, for executive, such as we're working with Morgan Stanley and Ernst & Young KPMG. We're doing some company tailored training. And for our full-time, oops, uh, small. Okay, sorry. 
where our full-time admin program is very intense, it's only 11 months, but you are required to take 60 credits to graduate. But the good news is we don't have a top limitation for the credits, so you can take whatever you want if you have time for that. And one of the most distinguished characters of our full-time program is we're very international, is our uh, diversity. For the current class, we have 32 students coming from 14 nations. In the previous class, we have 35 students coming from 17 nations. So it's a very international group. And uh, we're American business school, so after graduation, you will be granted a U.S. degree instead of a Hungarian degree. And uh, we have uh, 16 partners you know, around the world. Uh, after the 11 months, you are entitled to go to one of our 16 partner schools to further your uh, education. Um, I'm also the alumni of the business school, and when I graduated, I went to New York Stern because my background is in finance, and I also work for Ernst Young. <laughs> okay, so the minimum working experience is three years, but our average working experience is five years, and uh, the average age is 28, as you can say, as you can see. Oh, sorry, it's wrong. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is our curriculum. You can see for the first two weeks, there are all most like presentation, um, uh, orientation and warming up to let you uh, get used to the business school, the way of teaching. So the case study method is very important. That's what Professor Zoltan Buzadi is teaching because MBA is different from the general master degree. And uh, we are giving you a lot of power case studies analysis. So you need these basic skills. And then everyone is supposed to take the core courses. Uh, like accounting and finance, disregard your backgrounds. But as uh, if you do have some experience in accounting, like I worked for Ernst and Young, you are eligible to waive that course. And for the electives, we have um, so four concentrations, and that means you can take electives in within that within that area. That means you can concentrate on that area. For example. I like finance, so I took all the electives in finance classes, and my concentration will be finance. If you like uh, entrepreneurship or marketing, you can take classes within that area. And after it, we have the action learning classes, like Mel mentioned. It's a very practical classes. You can bring what you have learned during the whole semester to practice. For example, uh, in my class, we worked with a Hungarian uh, voice recognition company. They have a software that can detect emotion for call centers. So if you're calling the call center, if you're not happy, the people receiving the call will see it because they can see the wave of, of your emotion. And at that time, we are supposed to help them to make a business plan like which market to enter because they want to expand the Hungarian market. They want to go global. And we decided that maybe Poland is a very good place to go. And the next year, the company comes to us again because of the excellent work we delivered. And that, um, ne next year, they want us, they want the students to drop the business plan, especially for Poland market. And now I will give the floor to David to introduce a little bit about our executive. Thank you, Miao. If we can go just for a second back to previous slide, mm -hmm. I can add that um, if you can highlight uh, in the middle button if you push. This boardroom simulation, what you can see. This is something really, the thing we are proud of, kind of know-how of CU Business School. And uh, Tibor Voros, our distinguished faculty in IT management, he designed this. Unfortunately, he had to leave to some, uh, due to some uh, due <coughs> workload, did the workload and he's not now with us. But he recently received, actually last fall, he received special prize from Central, Central European Teaching Association. And the ceremony, awarding ceremony was in, <coughs> Italy so. So he received for his teaching excellency the special prize as the best teaching quality for this boardroom simulation. And this is very popular among our MBA class. Maybe did you have this experience? Was yes, I have this boardroom simulation. So we're working with MOL, M -O -L, the Hungarian gas company. Or gas company. Uh, we have to form a board like five people or six people and we have to make a decision whether or not to change the logo of this company. If they have the logo of the red triangle, but we have to discuss whether we want to change the green or uh, upside down triangle. So that's a very interesting class as well. Yeah, so this is part of our action learning and the real companies are consulted by our, by our MBA students and there are different issues as already Miao mentioned, every group has different tasks to do, business related with 
finance or corporate risk analysis. So this is very popular just to mention that our faculty also distinguished uh, to in the whole region. Now about the executive MBA program, I can tell you a few words. As I see some of you, I already know that you are particularly interested in this program. And uh, this, is, this is especially popular for the people who are residing in Hungary and in the neighboring regions, in Ukraine, Croatia, Austria, Slovakia, and Romania and Serbia. Because, because of the, its unique format of the classes, it's held on the weekends, from Friday afternoons till the Sunday noon. So basically classes start in Friday afternoons and they have also on Saturday classes and Sunday morning class. And this happens twice per month during 22 calendar months. So basically if everything goes well and the student doesn't fail the classes, but sometimes it happens because our students are quite strict and they don't give grades so easy. So if everything goes alright then the student can graduate this program within 22 months more or less two calendar years and receive American MBA degree. This program is also accredited by EMBA, Association of MBAs, and uh, as, as a whole our programs we give at the end the American degree. In order to receive this MBA degree, executive MBA degree, students should collect 48 uh, US American academic credits. This is part-time, so one of the biggest advantages of this program is that there is no career interruption. So some, many times, like frequently, we receive the question from future students and applicants, which program is better to do, full-time or executive MBA? Of course, there is no golden rule to answer uh, to this question. It depends particularly to you and your career goals. Like big advantage for the full-time MBA would be, particularly for our MBA doing, because this is only one year, that you fully concentrate on your studies. You just quit your job, you come to school, and whatever you learn, you just go directly to job and you try to improve yourself, your career, your accomplishments. But not all of us can do that, right? We have families, we need to earn some money, and but at the same time we want to get promotion at job, and sometimes MBA is very important, not just because of degree, but also the skills and knowledge which it gives. So from this point of view, advantages can be this program, because you have no career interruption, you keep your job, and whatever learn, whatever knowledge you get in the classes, you directly apply it to your job. And sometimes we have cases when students even are bringing their problems, which they have business cases or some project problems related to the class. And the beauty of this class is that we have senior people who are already in their middle or high level managerial positions, and all of them have got already some kind of so solid experience in different fields. So all of them can be kind of consultant and to advise to each other. Uh, average work experience here is eight years. So as you can see, a bit senior is this program because of the accomplishments which they have already made. And also average age is 33. The uh, program is held totally in Budapest during 22 months, but we will have also a New York module next year, which Mel already mentioned in his presentation. And executive MBA students will also have a chance to participate in this one-week module in New York, and they can also go and take three credits there. Um, in addition to that, they also have a chance to travel. Uh, after they graduate this program, they can participate in international exchange. We have exchange partners, Miao will tell later, starting from Shanghai, SIPs in China, to Stern Business School and Emory in Atlanta. So this is more or less uh, important, yes, about uh, ethnic di diversity. Majority of the class, I would not lie to you, they come from Hungary, but it does not mean that it's dominated by Hungarians, because still every year we have at least nine or ten different nationalities presented. Mostly these people are expats, like if, for example in current class we have Japanese students, we have British students, Ukrainian, and we have also people, for example, ladies flying twice per month from Kyiv, from Ukraine. She holds one of the big, uh, one of really the senior positions in the big multinational company. We have students from Austria, Slovakia, and Romania. So you should not imagine that if you come to this program, you will appear surrounded by only Hungarian students. So it's still multinational, and also gender balance is presented. It's kind of difficult to, to recruit ladies for this program, but still the gender balance is presented. We have ladies also in this program. So it's not only male and not only Hungarians. So about uh, this IMM program, this is our third program in our program portfolio, or MBA programs. This is kind of more top level program, which is done in consortium together with Purdue University, Gisma from Germany, and Tias Nimbus, Netherlands. Uh, this is for the people who have already reached high level managerial positions and uh, who want to 
accomplish their studies from theoretical goals, practical uh, also perspective. And uh, another addition of this pro pro program, I would say, is that we have excellent opportunity of networking. So you can meet top people all, all around the world. And besides attending these four campuses in four different countries, you have also residentials. So in total, there are five two-week residences. Uh, in, including in China, there are Shanghai and Beijing, and also recently was added Mexico. Program runs for 18 months, as I mentioned already, it's on the six campuses, and at the end they are awarded students two diplomas. Uh, one, one is from, the, like, let's say, from the country of origin. If the student comes from Hungary, one will be from CU, and another is Purdue, or depends on their choice. Um, another important thing that this program has dual accreditation from AASD and also from AMBA and of course the most important is the highly reputable program and it's been uh, ranked in top 20 programs among uh, executive MBAs in the whole Europe and also in the specific ranking for example it's number two for career progress and salary rise and number one for the international course experience. Okay, here comes the admission process. How to apply to our school is very easy and we don't charge you for the application fee. So first you log on to our website and everything is, will, will be online. You don't have to deliver physical anything to us. Um, first, we need an online application. So you register your own username and password. You log in and log out as you want. And then we want a certificate, an English copy of your degree and transcript. And then you have to write a two pages state, statement of purpose mainly why MBA, why now, why CEU, and it kind of link your past and your current and your future together to let us see what's your career goal, why you need an MBA now, why you're interested in our program. And then we need your resume to see that you have at least three years working experience for our requirements. We also need two letters of recommendations from your direct um, supervisor. It's better to have it from your colleagues or the business partners if you are running business if you are running a family business. Uh, we don't recommend from a very high level like CEO or CFO if you don't know them very well if they don't know you very well because the recommendation letter is like the compliments to the statement uh, motivational letter. We want to see you as like a person, not just what you said you are. We want to see other people's opinion as well. And then we require the GMAT or the GRE scores. If you have 10 years working experience or 7 years working experience plus a master degree or a PhD degree, you, have, you are entitled to have the waiver for the GMAT score. Um, we also require the language scores like TOEFL and else. But if you're the native speaker, uh, if you attend schools which uh, the, the whole classes are taught in English, you have the waiver for that. And after all these um, documents, we call it application dorsal, and you will have the phone interview. And after the interview, uh, we will make the final decision based on the result of the interview and the quality, quality of your application documents. Uh, about the program cost, because we're a heavily, in, we have heavy, a very heavy, very large endowment from Mr. Soros, so our tuition fee is approachable to the young talents. Um, uh, for full time now currently it's 12,000 euro per program but you don't have to pay it one time we, 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 we ask you to pay it in two separate installments so like the first semester half and the second semester half for the executive the part time MBA is 15,000 euro and you have to pay it in two years in two installments and for the IMM program it's 52,500 euro Okay, here comes the alumni and career service. Yes, and here comes the question why to do all this MBA, what I can get afterwards. So we of course consider this question and that's why we have very powerful, specially designed alumni and career services office, which even during the crisis time, like which was more like a few felt during 2008 and 2009, even that time it was quite successful in giving much and more opportunities to our graduates. So they conduct and arrange over 100 interview appointments per year for our students. They have very strong relationships with my major multinational companies in the region. As I know, some of you even came through their, con through their contacts, which our career service has. And the excellent opportunity which must to be highlighted is a corporate showcase series, 
which is often conducted at our school. So many well-known companies like, for example, Nokia Siemens Networks, I can say, or Lufthansa also was recently, they come to the school with their senior managers, so either line director or sometimes even CEO or the regional guard director for the whole Central Eastern Europe region, they come to school, they give presentation about their company or particular segment which they manage, and the students get opportunity to talk with the high people of this company directly. It does not matter whether they are executive MBA or full-time MBA students. All of us are still looking right for some new opportunities, or even not only for looking for job, but to build up some new partnerships to have some new business opportunities. So this is one of the excellent tools which our career services can provide to you. Another is that at every graduation year we have resume book which is circulated among major companies which are located in Hungary and in the whole region. And we have many examples that uh, like in this resume book they are student CVs of our graduate and executive MBA students and uh, many of our students and alumni just directly got phone calls from the companies, HR departments reviewed in this resume book their CVs and afterwards they went for a job interview and they got job. Um, uh, another interesting thing is that this career service, service conducts for free workshops and seminars conducted by professional headhunters and professional consultants how to write professional CV and resume and to make it specially tailored whether you are apply which particular industry you need to present kind of specially tailored CV resume and to highlight the specific uh, points from your career. They also uh, give trainings how to write professional cover letter and how to prepare yourself for, to be uh, solid and without uh, some ner nervous uh, feelings for the uh, job interview. So all these services are provided by our um, special office which we have and uh, we, uh, we have not highlighted the fact but our school is one of the oldest in this region, not one of them but really we are proud of because it, it was opened in 1988 and it became so far the first American type, Western type MBA provider in the whole Central Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union region. So you can imagine, it's already 23 years uh, old, the school and all the generations, we are counting up to 1,000 alumni and all these people are all around the world in different industries at different levels. For example, we have uh, ambassadors among our network, uh, ambassador of Hungary to the United Kingdom was one of our alumni and in different sectors not only in business but also in government and NGO they are heavily presented and we often organize uh, networking sessions to bring alumni together from different countries to give them opportunity to know each other and to find out some business partners or some new opportunities so we try to keep in touch of all these uh, almost 1000 uh, alumni which we have these are one of the companies which can be dream companies for some of the people. Here are presented consulting uh, companies, also Ernst & Young, as you can see, GE is here, Citigroup, ING and United Nations. We are particularly strong with expertise besides the uh, lectures which was already developed, government and public relations. We are also very proud to be strong in finance. So that's why most of our students choose finance concentrations and as a result they end up in uh, finance and banking sector. And uh, also we have the students in the United Nations sector working. So as you can see it's quite diverse uh, uh, representation where you can have uh, job opportunities after graduation MBA or our MBA program. And uh, at the end, if you think that all these presentations were convincing for you, if you think that CU Business School can be a place for your study, please feel free to talk with us directly. Right now we will have the networking session on the terrace or afterwards check out our website, which is cubusiness.org or write to us email or please call me for So for full-time and executive me and Miao for particular admission questions, for IMM program, our professor Maria Fiendrick is here present. So if some of you is particularly interested in IMM program, please feel free to address uh, Professor Fiendrick. And uh, so far, if you don't have any questions, then thank you for coming and thank you for the attention. All of you are welcome for the reception on the panel.